first of all, a, a thanks of uh, inviting me today to this uh, uh, keynote lecture and to do this uh, day. So I'm seeing a lot of uh, yeah, known faces. Um, and uh, as I said, I, I also know Debbie from yeah, the, the time when we were junior, as they call it. Uh, but uh, so it's uh, nice for me to, to talk a bit about uh, international standards and how they are linked to modern build environment. Um, I cannot be completely, let us say, uh, complete in my, my talk and uh, go into details of everything, but uh, I try to give you what, what we call, and I'm Belgian from origin, but I'm living in Sweden, and you all know the so-called uh, the smorgasbord or the buffet board, and I try to do that today also, to, to give you some thoughts, uh, so I hope you uh, take some of them with you when you leave uh, from from here. Uh, I'm not going to talk too much about the, the, the structure of TC92, but a little bit at least, so you see how it is organized. I uh, want to talk a little bit about the history of fire safety and trends in fire safety. It has to do a little bit also to the, the historical relevance of international standardization. Again, not being able to be complete and then dig in all the history, what exactly was uh, achieved in ISO, but I have a few examples which uh, show the, the relevance and the importance of, of international standardization. Uh, and since I yeah, uh, teach uh, at the University of Ghent and uh, N in, in Lund, also performance-based design uh, within our Erasmus Mundus program, um, I, I want to, to do this link between performance-based design and the challenges we have for standardization, uh, not only now, but also in the, the future, um, because I think that's quite uh, important. Uh, quickly, the uh, structure of uh, ISO TC92. Uh, as Debbie mentioned, I am the chair of the, and I'm under the wings of PSI here in the UK, so I somehow work for uh, the UK uh, standardization uh, work. Uh, we then have at the moment four subcommittees. Uh, one is on fire initiation and growth, uh, chaired by uh, Dr. Chris Lucas, and she is here also, I've seen. So uh, if you have some questions on that part, you can almost go immediately to her. So. Um, and then we have uh, the so-called fire, fire containment or uh, fire resistance area, which is chaired by John Nicholas from, from ANSI in the, the US. And then we have two chair, uh, let's say two uh, subcommittees uh, uh, under the wings of AFNOR. The first one is uh, fire threat to people and the environment, uh, which is chaired by Eric Guillaume, and then one on fire safety engineering, um, chaired by Daniel Nilsson. Uh, he is uh, a previous colleague from from the University of Lund before he moved to Christchurch in, uh, in New Zealand. So he took a little bit of uh, a shift of the uh, one side of the world to the other. Uh, so that's the structure uh, as it is at for the moment. Uh, under the wings of TC92, we have, let us say, uh, major three areas of new activities. We don't know where they will end up. They might end up just in nothing happening, but we, are, we have three task groups who who work on different aspects, and one is on outdoor fires and wildland fires, uh, which have been uh, quite uh, important uh, uh, recently, uh, and I come back to that also in my, my speech later. Uh, one is on rescue services, and, and I, I kept the title very short because it's, it's not maybe on really rescue uh, service tactics, but more on, on the uh, circumstances and, and how the uh, rescue service are, for instance, exposed during uh, their actions and uh, to, to get some kind of, a, uh, let's say, performance requirements, what, what is uh, uh, connected to the rescue services. And then we have one on tunnels. Uh, there's quite a lot of international work on tunnels, but there is, in fact, in the whole organization of ISO, uh, not any uh, TEC technical committee who works with international standards on it. It's more on uh, organizations like PRAC and so on who work in it. So we will try to see how we can, let's say at ISO level, work maybe with one of these three uh, items. It can also that it just uh, doesn't find the support internationally because that's uh, of course needed to, to get uh, further with these kind of uh, actions. Uh, 
So that's quickly about uh, the, the ISO structure. I know I'm going to talk about all the, let's say, visions from ISO and so on. I think you can easily go to the website of ISO. I want to, to go more into depth to, to the, let's say, the fire safety issues. Uh, and that brings me a little bit on, on the historical perspective on fire safety. And you can either agree with me or you can disagree. Uh, but uh, when we look backwards, uh, we, we somehow went from uh, and fire safety protecting first the whole city uh, and went down all the way, and I'll give slides in a moment, to a single compartment or a single flat. Uh, and we had a, quite a historical development, which you all know, on detailed uh, requirements, uh, prescriptive requirements, as they uh, also uh, mention, uh, concerning all these kind of technical solutions. And the innovation part uh, was sometimes rather limited. And from that uh, need that uh, been uh, towards the end of the 20th century, more also, let us say, a move from prescriptive regulation to be uh, more regulation based on, on performance uh, requirements. Uh, and, and the first thing I, I always try to, to, uh, to mention here is uh, that we should think a little bit on on the history, as I said, we had, and uh, I know there have been a number of London uh, big city fires here also in the past, and we are going very much back. Uh, but we started with city fires, and we thought that this was a serious problem and the whole city burning down. So we started with putting, and you see that still something sometimes in, in old cities, uh, these so-called fire corridors between different uh, let us say, districts, if I can use that word, uh, of the city. So to avoid that, if it started burning in one district, only the district was lost, but not the whole city. Uh, but at a certain moment, we're not very satisfied with that. So we said, okay, we need to keep it inside the house. And we need uh, maybe distances between houses or, or very big firewalls between the built houses if they are connected to each other. And so then when we still were not happy with to lose complete housings, uh, and so on, and then we said we, we want to uh, start with compartmentation. We want to keep the fire in uh, a certain size of a fire compartment or a fire cell. It's sometimes used in other uh, disciplines, and uh, if we think about um, more uh, process safety and so on, um, and we, we want to keep it there. So when we don't want to have it started there, and we don't want to have it uh, developing too quickly. Um, and in some cases, we went over to limiting uh, the event of a flashover. Uh, but you somehow see that the compartment is, is a f not, I'm not going to say the last border, but at the moment something you use in, uh, in, in a concept. And that if we now just see, and if you think about your own house or your own apartment, uh, in that um, apartment or in that house, uh, there is a part maybe from if you have some, some heating uh, uh, room, uh, not really uh, a differentiation that the fire not, could not spread. Uh, and and we, we've run uh, uh, a lot of research in recent years in Sweden on limiting the uh, deaths of uh, uh, fires uh, in, in uh, res residential areas. And we've seen that in order to go a step further, to reduce them even more, we have to do something more within the compartment whatever it is to reduce the fire growth or to limit it. So we, we have somehow a history in it. And we have to think about that also when we introduce, let's say, innovations in, in the whole system, that we don't forget the history. We are sometimes that, that we don't want to lose the whole building. We don't want to lose maybe even more than one building. So, and and I, I think this is something just to, to remind that we have gone this kind of historical um, uh, evolution and, and we should not forget uh, that we're not going back by maybe building too close and too, uh, too high so uh, without uh, proper uh, measures. Uh, this is just uh, an example of all the fires we had in, in Sweden in the 1800s. Uh, so it's amazing how many city fires there were just as a, uh, a list of it. Uh, it was not only I think in the UK. But what happened uh, a lot at the same time is that we got a lot of trends in fire safety, uh, a lot of impact of building design, and these are just 
uh, a, a number of uh, examples of big atrias in, inside buildings, uh, large halls like, like you have at airports, uh, uh, high-rise buildings. The, the one on the right is, is our turning torso in Malmo, which is uh, for Sweden the and only one of the few high-rise uh, buildings, but it was also designed with performance-based um, techniques. And, uh, and it's, it's a need somehow to, to introduce that because you get into maybe uh, you lose the overall fire safety if, if you look to the, the prescriptive uh, systems. I think on the left bottom, it's, uh, it's a house uh, made of a wooden structure and that gets also. So you have a lot of these kind of uh, innovations. And, uh, I think it's important to uh, to see that you have these innovative uh, buildings. Uh, some of these buildings are so-called what I call multifunctional or complex. Can you say it also, uh, where you mean that you don't have only uh, residential uh, housing, but uh, on the bottom floor maybe you have a big shopping mall and it's maybe connected to an underground. Uh, there are offices there sometimes. Uh, uh, connections to a bus station and so on. And we have, in fact, in, in Sweden, a number of them. Uh, and they get uh, all uh, very complicated. And then we go towards green buildings, uh, introducing new technologies and so on, uh, which are important. We have a lot of digitalization. Uh, everything is steered and controlled by, by automatic systems. And uh, we have also, at the end, new threats. And new threats, I'll come back also to that. But uh, some of them can be you know, antagonistic, at, uh, antagonistic threats, um, which uh, means that the, the type of fire source is a bit higher than the ones we normally design for. Uh, but the new threats can be also, of course, connected to, to accidental uh, large uh, events like, uh, like wildland fires. And everything is, is uh, in this picture, uh, both the high-rise buildings everywhere in the world, uh, but also uh, to the right, uh, I have a picture of a so-called completely self-dependent de uh, uh, house where all the energy, the electricity is produced inside the house by solar cells, by wind energy, uh, and by kinds of Stirling motor and everything. The concept has changed also. Uh, and we have maybe forgotten uh, our history in that uh, and going back to older, let us say, older electrical technologies uh, which um, uh, we have to address also the fire safety. And I have also a, an example of a complex, uh, or at least a, a rather complex system of a facade. And everything becomes a very complex system. Uh, and that means that it is, uh, in order to manage all these complex systems, it, it's uh, uh, important to introduce performance-based design. I'm not going to go through the the details of the procedure, but this is an example of the procedure. And I use the SFPA hand, uh, handbook for perfor uh, performance-based design, but the ISO standard is, is almost identical, uh, just adding uh, more details in the procedure and having different uh, items uh, from defining scope goals and so on to defining performance criteria and, and, and design fire scenarios and so on. Um, and then running trial designs, which quite often are complicated uh, calculations. Uh, so when I come back to that also later, uh, and then check if, if you fulfill this. And it's a very simple drawing, but of course the, the whole thing behind it to do it is quite complex also, to ma manage to go from uh, a system where you say, okay, we, we have so many, uh, let's say fire exits and the distance from where you're sitting to the nearest uh, exit is so long, it should be less than that in order to have a safe. In case of a performance-based design, you look to the criteria that you have to have a safe escape for the person. Uh, and you don't count it always in, in distances and, and doors. You do uh, advanced fire calculations and advanced uh, evacuation simulations. And that also has to fit together, otherwise it, it will not work. So that's the, the area of the performance-based uh, uh, design. And to give somehow a, a quick overview of the history and the trends, um, again, I'm sure in this uh, 40 minutes I cannot be complete, but it's just to give you uh, an idea of the, of the different routes. Uh, and then I want to talk a little bit more about, let's say, the, 
the histo historical relevance of international standardization. It's not that I want to give a history lecture here today, but I just want to mention a little bit to, to see how important standardization has been for today's situation and especially the work done, done in ISO. Uh, and then later I go a little bit into the future and the challenges uh, on it. Um, there are three things that I want to mention uh, quickly. The ISO A34 fire curve, the Euro classes for building products and fire safety engineering uh, procedures, just as an example. They are not complete, uh, again, um, but how ISO, in fact, has introduced uh, certain um, standards or certain procedures into uh, quite often regional, whether it's a European or American standardization or whether it's uh, let us say, uh, national regulation. Uh, we can discuss that uh, if we talk about the ISO 834 curve, whether it originated from ISO or from maybe uh, a specific country, but at least the, the, the name of ISO, 8, uh, ISO 834 uh, and the curve, the standard fire curve for fire resistance is, is well known. And it comes, in fact, from international collaboration. Has not been easy of always to agree on that, uh, but it has been uh, from from the past. And uh, later, uh, people were maybe not happy. And you see the ISO curve as the bottom curve. That uh, in certain cases with hydrocarbons, uh, maybe the fire exposure was was higher, and then uh, the so-called hydrocarbon curve was introduced. Uh, and also now. The, that has been established in, in ISO and also used in, in different, maybe less in buildings, to be honest, but uh, at least in, in the process industry and, and in also, in, for instance, in, in tunnels, uh, if we want to have an example from at least the construction area. And, and that is used in order to determine, as on the uh, left of the, the picture, the fire resistance, for instance, of a, of a composite uh, wall assembly. Uh, and that, that's historically quite an influence. It has a, gotten a lot of influence, taking um, again the connection, as I said earlier, with uh, the fact that we wanted to keep the fire into a fire compartment and you needed fire compartmentation and testing to be done. Prescriptive testing in this case. The other thing is uh, what we forget, we, ha we all uh, have our certification CE marking and uh, uh, been a few years out of that business. Uh, uh, but uh, um, I'm still following it, but uh, a lot of the standards for um, wall linings, floor coverings have been uh, originated from ISO or in, in case of cables from IEC. Uh, and they came through ISO into the uh, SEN and many of these uh, standards, if you see, have a, a double designations, uh, E and ISO. Uh, because they have been, in fact, developed in, in ISO. And I don't want to show you all of them, the small burner test, which is the lowest, let us say, level for C marking of wall linings, uh, has been uh, quite a lot based, of course, on the, on, a, on the German test, but it has been first developed further into ISO and then came into uh, the EN system. Same is for the radiant flooring panel. Maybe it originated a little bit more from the US, but it was standardized internationally. And, by the international standardization, you got also the consensus, I guess, at some, uh, to, to get this standard into a broader field. It's no longer a single national standard, but it's somehow a, a, uh, an accepted international. It means that it changes from maybe the original one because of the, uh, let's say, the negotiations and the uh, consensus within ISO. And the consensus in ISO is one of the, uh, let us say, um, basic um, items to solve uh, within international so organization. ISO wants have to have consensus. Easier said sometimes than done, to be honest. But um, uh, it, it, at the end, when the standard is in place, it, uh, it has reached a, a certain amount of, of consensus. Other standards are caloric potential, non-combustibility tests. Uh, and everything for the, the basis of our, uh, and I have a picture of it later from the single burning item test for wall linings, was based on a reference scenario, which was the room corner test. And the room corner test originates from, from ISO, uh, the ISO 9705 test. So there, you see there's a lot of uh, preparation work being done in ISO, and then it comes into 
uh, let's say, regional levels or national levels. And I think that's uh, important uh, to, to remember. Uh, we can um, work out maybe in the future other uh, examples. I don't want to uh, uh, focus only on the prescriptive solutions, which I mentioned earlier, but also on, let's say, the fire safety engineering, or, which is a lot based on this performance-based design, as I mentioned. Um, this uh, performance-based uh, design has gone with quite, quite a lot of high speed within ISO. Uh, uh, I think uh, might be not correct the latest numbers, but uh, the subcommittee four dealing with fire safety engineering has published almost 20 standards. Some of them are maybe more technical reports, uh, but on procedures, and, and I, I just mentioned a few of them, uh, we have the general principles of performance-based design, as I gave uh, this scheme of SFPA, which has been the basis for the, also for the ISO uh, standard, uh, verification and validation codes in order to see whether your calculation methods are, are really uh, predicting what you expect they should predict uh, and how it has been verified or validated so that the number you get out of this sometimes colorful uh, pictures is, is correct. Uh, there are examples uh, recently developed for different uh, structure on, on functional performance or of structure. I think there are six parts depending on, let's say, the major constructional um, design, whether it's wood or steel or concrete and so on. Uh, and there's uh, design fires. In, in the whole concept of performance-based design, you assume a certain design fire. Either it's through the regulation or the regulator defining it, or you have to define it from what's the content here, uh, the chairs, uh, maybe the wall linings, what kind of fire development you will have, uh, and what heat release will be that at the end. And I just give an example to the right, where you see this so-called alpha T square, uh, curve um, in increasing, corresponding, for instance, with either very quick flame spread or even a flashover situation. You come down to a, a, a kind of constant heat release, either because of the ventilation restrictions or whether you maybe have introduced uh, sprinklers uh, into the system. That depends. And then later, when either the fire has been controlled by your uh, active system or you just have run out of fuel, you have a decay period. And this is just an example. It's not, uh, as I said, um, uh, casted in concrete uh, complete, but it's some, somehow a, an, an example how you can deal and how a fire safety engineer works. To get there, there needs to be a lot of evaluation, a lot of thinking and expert uh, input in it. <coughs> Uh, the design fire has uh, been a concept which uh, sometimes being called also uh, funny numbers uh, or, uh, because there are numbers like 5 megawatts, uh, 10 megawatts, and uh, we should never forget that there has been somewhere uh, a basic background that we don't, don't should pick them up from the shelf, but also think about are they realistic. And in certain cases, and I, I know that the ex one of the examples is, uh, in fact, um, um, Sweden, but also, uh, if I correct, uh, New Zealand, the regulator themselves have to start to say this is the kind of minimum design fire you have to fulfill so that you net can try to uh, motivate that, yeah, but we have very low amount of ignitable materials uh, and you come to very, uh, if I'm being a little bit arrogant, in unrealistic, too nice fires. Uh, and that the regulator should say this is the minimum, but you still have to, to see as a fire safety engineer if you don't have to protect it for uh, more severe. I think this is important. Uh, there's a lot of work done now in ISO to, to put together more procedures how to define that. Okay. Uh, because I, I experienced that with the students in, in the courses uh, to set up a design fire from, let's say, uh, scratch almost is not the easiest way. And there are a lot of questions popping up because it's not just opening a textbook, it's reasoning and doing risk analysis and so on uh, and defining what, what possible sources there, there are. So these are three examples uh, how the history uh, has affected, in fact, our uh, fire safety uh, and on, on the build environment. Um, I want to look also a little bit in, into the future 
uh, I decided in some way or another to, uh, because we now recently, the, the recent years, have a quite established amount of standards in the prescriptive regulations. I think there are many, uh, let us say, uh, EN and ISO standards connected to the wall linings, floor linings, cables, and so on. There are a lot of, uh, uh, and I think it's a whole suite of, of tests on fire resistance, depending from dampers to walls to doors and so on. So I didn't want to say, okay, what should we do more there? Uh, maybe we should try to structurize it more so that you can get a view that it's not uh, picking a test, which uh, is maybe not the correct test. And I will talk a little bit about that also, because I think it is also true for, for prescriptive systems. But I want to focus a little bit more on let's say challenges for this performance-based design, and, and this is a challenge for, uh, let us say, the, um, uh, this, the standardization. Um, and, and this has to do with the tools for modeling, this has to do with new threats, uh, complex infrastructure environments, and system thinking. I will finish up with this system thinking uh, in, in my talk. And everything is connected to this scheme again. Uh, where you define goals for your, for your overall project objectives and define performance criteria for your um, uh, design. Uh, you see here in the middle, you have to design your design fire scenario. I focused on the heat release, but the same is related to how, let's say, if you want to do evacuation uh, calculation, you want to see how many people there are in the building, what type of populations, and so on. You have to make these kind of different scenarios, different uh, alternatives, uh, which can happen. And it's not always enough, uh, maybe with one. And then you have to do trial designs. You have to do some CFD calculations. And I, I remember when I was a PhD student, and I almost have forgotten when I was a PhD student, I went to a course on one of the basic tools, which was uh, zone model and, and had, has that one from, developed by NIST. And on that course, they always said, uh, at that moment, at that moment, zone models were quite easy to run, but still a little bit more difficult than maybe it, it would be today. Uh, you cannot just come with uh, a solution and come with one or two simulations. You have to have done a, a tons of si simulation to see sensitivities and so on. And these days, we have moved from these zone models to CFDs, because, because uh, some of the CFD models are today rather easy to use. Uh, which is not always good also if they are too easy to use. Uh, but you cannot say, okay, this is the CFD simulation, I've done one. And then you have always to ask the question, well, but did you do, do some kind of sensitivity analysis or not? Uh, because else uh, it can be uh, one, uh, one single shot and that's not, not good. And the question is, is that the good shot then? And then at the end, you, you have to get this, this uh, check of, of the design uh, with the performance criteria. So as I said, uh, there's a lot of modeling done these days. Uh, and and uh, coming from the academic world, a lot of the research is done on modeling, uh, defining uh, the pyrolysis products from, from materials, uh, um, but also trying to predict more and more the fire spread, um, smoke, uh, transport in buildings and so on. And these models are somehow a big package with a lot of sub-packages. And all these sub-packages either look to the combustion, to the fluid dynamics, uh, to the heat transfer and so on. And, and all of them needs input. Uh, in, in the most easiest way, going to uh, the heat transfer as an example, you, you need maybe the, the, the thermal conductivity of a material. Uh, and you don't need it at standard ambient because then you just can go into the textbooks and look to a certain material X and this has a thermal conductivity. No, it has to be a function of temperature. Uh, and and it, maybe even the material undergoes some transformation. It releases water or there's maybe a calcination process where the cal uh, calcium becomes water and so on and then it, it maybe starts evaporating and so on. So it's a lot of things happening there. And you have to put that in. You cannot not just always use the templates which are available in the model for new materials. So you, and, and we, uh, we really lack, in fact, good uh, tests for that. And I think this is the challenge for ISO uh, to, of course, we can put into place a lot of procedures of how to do the uh, design and so on. We also need 
uh, for these more advanced um, models, the input. Otherwise, it gets picking up the numbers and, and you don't know exactly what will happen if it gets, for instance, a little bit hotter with the thermal conductivity. Uh, and I think that this, this is just, just an example, but the same is, is valid for uh, when a material starts to pilotize, how much gases and so on. I don't want to go too much in the academic part, but this, there's need to test. And now every, let us say, research uh, group starts to invent their own test, but I think there needs to be some kind of a, uh, a merge to add some procedures and some general uh, guidance for that, so that we don't have every, uh, let's say, the Lund uh, test and then uh, maybe the Maryland or the Edinburgh test and so on. I, I don't think, uh, but maybe we are a bit too early, but I, I see this as a challenge. Uh, and the other thing is that uh, the picture to the right is just a simple five by five by five, uh, very tight, airtight room with uh, two ventilation systems, an inlet and an outlet, uh, and a, a simple pool fire. Uh, and this was done in a, in a research project for the nuclear uh, industry, uh, just trying to predict the interaction of the pool with the fire and with the ventilation, and vice versa, the ventilation with, with the fire, is not an uh, easy task. So you need test data to check if your <coughs> calculations are really making some sense. Do, do you take into account, for instance, if the fire becomes underventilated or not? Uh, and I don't want to be, let's say, uh, only pointing out the, uh, the danger of them, but I, I think it's my task as a uh, as coming from the academic world, also to wave from time to time, we cannot use this without a proper validation. And, and can you imagine if we have validated this type of scenario with one single room with an inlet and an outlet, if we're trying to simulate then the smoke transport in the whole building, can we rely on that we have validated this tool at this small level? Yes or no? I leave the answer up to you a, a bit. Uh, but I think it's, it's, it's a dangerous way to start extrapolating too much. And it's not easy because we cannot do tremendous amount of real skill tests, but there is a need to have very well-defined scenarios. And you cannot say suddenly that you have done the validation for one scenario and that will be valid also suddenly for an atria, for instance. I think you, you, uh, we have to be very cautious. And, and some softwares have validation manuals, but it doesn't mean that they have done everything which is uh, is important for, for the overall, let us say, check of the, the modeling. And at the end of the day, there's, everything has to do with uncertainties. Uh, it might be that there's a certain un uncertainty uh, in these and we have to define them because the uncertainties lead to the next step. You have maybe to introduce safety levels. For those who know the so-called ASET, RSET calculations, I've seen examples where, where the ASET and the RSET are compared in, uh, and uh, approved when we are only have a difference of a few seconds. Is that really okay? Uh, are you so sure that you can do that type of calculation within this one second? So we may, might need, in certain cases, to ad address through the uncertainties some kind of safety levels or safety margins. Or the regulate, maybe, should say it. it it's up to, uh, I'm not the one there who decide, but I think we have to think about it. And some regulations have it, but some have just, uh, if it's equal, it's okay. Uh, and that's maybe not the perfect solution. I mentioned also the, uh, the fact on, on new threats and other uh, fire scenarios, and I want to mention two of them. First one is, of course, the antagonistic attacks with a very high combined external impact. It can be an explosion of fire. I don't want to run here a, a kind of a, a scary um, a speech on, on all the kind of different uh, uh, antagonistic attacks who can uh, happen, but we, we might have to think about that what, uh, if we don't know whether we can have the building safe for a certain scenario, that we at least would know what is, will be lost then, so that we can come with, with a proposal uh, towards the uh, decision makers, uh, what would be the consequence uh, of, of such a um, possible uh, attack. And, and somehow the, 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 the simplest uh, antagonistic attacks, if I am allowed to under, do this understatement, is, is simply a, a, an arson fire uh, on, on a school. I think uh, we, we still struggle with a lot of 
uh, arson fires uh, in, in schools in Sweden. It's, it, it's sometimes surprising that, uh, that you have to say it, but it, it's true. A few years ago, I think we have about, and now I have to do some calculations, but I think it's about 100 million pounds of losses in school fires due to arson. Some of them, uh, and there were maybe 10 very big ones, but there was complete, complete schools lost in it. And it was always arson, so it was not accidental. So I think 90% was arson related. And we had to look to that because we had built up our fire safety a lot on safety of life within the school building, but not from the outside. So there were a lot of deficiencies in the buildings uh, when the fire attack came from the outside. A container which was put on fire and put against the school walls and so on. We come back to that uh, sensitive topic of facades, but uh, it came down some quite often in the attic and so on. And, and the example, uh, it's maybe a little bit dark here on the, on the picture, is, is simply a, a school where a, a box with toys was uh, ignited um, by some kids uh, and put fire on, on, our, on a wooden facade and then uh, by coincidence, and it's like the Murphy Law, the, this box was exactly uh, on the outside of the building where two fire compartments were uh, exactly the difference. So it came from the outside inside two compartments at the same time because it was somehow just talking about, let's say, Murphy, but you can see it. And there was no real same symmetrical thinking on that the fire uh, resistance would be also from outside to the inside. It's, it's, a, it's a tricky, of course, you can say, okay, it, is this beginner's uh, fault, but it, it sometimes you, people are not thinking that this uh, could happen from the outside. So you have to think sometimes in other um, yeah, tracks. Uh, another thing which we, uh, and I, I give a little bit examples of Sweden, but they are, apart from maybe the arson fires in schools, uh, we have, uh, unfortunately, uh, not a good statistics there, but, uh, uh, and it's a lot to do with non-technical issues, of course, but uh, that's not part of my talk. Uh, but the other example I, I want to give is, is in fact, uh, not natural disasters, uh, whether it's, uh, for instance, the earthquake in Japan causing a lot of fires afterwards, or wildfires we had in, in Australia a few years or this year also, uh, but uh, we thought we were somehow saved from this problem in, 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 in Sweden and in Nordic countries uh, uh, until this summer. We thought it's a cool climate, it's a lot of wet, it rains a lot and so on, we don't have to. But this summer we have, I guess, similar to the UK, very dry summer. And this picture is, is a picture of the number of uh, forest fires uh, in the middle of July uh, in Sweden this year. So from suddenly that we didn't have uh, a problem with that, according to our um, uh, let's say government, uh, we had a massive problem. We had fires which were defined as non-extinguishable unless there would be uh, coming rain, and the rain took almost a month, so there were fires going on for a month, luckily in very unpopulated areas, but we had to uh, evacuate small towns and so on. So we suddenly got into another type of thinking. We even had, to be honest, ask for massive support from other countries to attack these fires and to control it, because the resources were not built up to that. Uh, so, and, and this is something which some people now, of course, say it's due to the climate change and so on and so on. I'm not going to be the one, uh, because that's more, not my research area, to say that this is, but it, it's, it shows that there can be a problem. And I don't want to be critical, but about two, three years ago, we had a, a short two weeks of dry period, and there had been also a big fire. But they say, okay, this is a once-in-a-lifetime experience. So uh, we, we don't have to put more investment on observation planes and so on, extinguishing planes. Now we have to take them from France. Uh, we have to take massive amount of fire people from, from Germany and Poland and so on to help us. Uh, and, and this is something which, of course, affects also the buildings. And we have to think about how much we can have um, a lot of buildings inside populated areas. We had even fires starting in, in Gothenburg and Stockholm in the cities uh, because we, we have this kind of, let us say, synergy between the, the cities and, and the, the green environment with a lot of forest areas inside cities also. And then you can have a problem if that one starts burning. 
I've mentioned already this new type of complex infrastructures, multifunctional buildings. Uh, you have a lot of societal functions on it. Uh, I think we, we need to challenge and how to design uh, these buildings and to see what kind of requirements are put on us. Um, you have these buildings where you have more than one transport system. And many people, and many people are not used maybe to the building. Um, it's some people come there every day, but some people come there maybe only once in their lifetime and they don't know exactly what all the facilities are. So uh, the example of the picture is the, uh, uh, we don't have very big cities, but we have the, uh, this is the, uh, this, let's say the transport center in, in Helsingborg, where, where it's in the south of Sweden also, where you have a train station, a bus station, uh, there is a ferry terminal, um, there's a, a large uh, parking garage, there are offices and so on. And there had been a few problems with small fires, not only affecting maybe the safety of life and uh, uh, property protection, but one of the functional requirements, or the third one, is connected to, it still has to run, the function of the, so this is the major connection between the, the south and, and the, the north on the west coast. If that station is out of order, and I experience it a lot because I commute, uh, there's a big problem. So it cannot be lost completely for several months. Um, environmental aspects, um, we have to look to that also, and the fire safety engineer has big challenge there. Uh, we have a lot of extinguishing foams. Uh, again, this picture of Sweden, sorry, they are always to use Sweden, but it's uh, easier for me. These are all the, uh, the wells, I think is the correct English word, the water wells, which are polluted by PFS uh, extinguishing foams. It's quite impressive. It's all close to old kind of training centers and so on. Uh, and it stays there. It's not easy to get it rid if it's uh, in the water. So we have the problems of flame retardants. Um, and, and we have a, a, a focus that we almost also have to reduce the amount of water when we attack fires. And it's very difficult, of course, uh, um, yeah, choice. And we have the wildland fires and so on. So uh, for the last, let's say, five minutes, I want to go with it uh, quick to the system thinking, uh, which uh, we, we need to, to do in, in in the whole performance-based design. I hope I gave already examples from that the problem is, is quite big if we have these bigger buildings. Uh, I give here just a, an example of, uh, it's not from TC92, but from another committee, what a system is. Uh, I'm not gonna read it aloud, but uh, the system engineering area, where we maybe should also look a little bit to, uh, uses a lot of different tools uh, for very complex systems. Uh, by using modeling, uh, simulation, maybe also testing and so on to find a, 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 a good uh, design. Uh, and why do we need this system thinking? I think we, we have, on one hand, higher energy demands. Uh, we get more towards mechanical ventilation. It can cause underventilated fires uh, if you make the buildings very tight. We don't design anything about that. And Higher insulation is meaning also that you have higher temperatures uh, and external insulation put onto maybe an existing building, if we talk about renovation, uh, requires also quite a complex uh, solution and it has to be uh, fire safe, so we have to see the whole system. Uh, and traditionally we have been using fire testing uh, at international level or at regional leveling level which are standardized. And the question is always, is, is this fitting? Uh, it's based on a specific scenario uh, for a specific uh, type of fire, but not maybe applicable to all kinds of fires. Uh, and I'm just gonna give, I thought I would use, uh, I've been working mainly much more on sandwich panel than on facade system, but I anyhow go into uh, the, the danger to use facade systems as an example, where you have different type of fires, you have different risks, different systems and so on and a lot of type of tests. So, and you can apply this kind of system thing, or you call it holistic view on everything, uh, also on other th things like uh, complex cable system, calories and so on, where it's not always the exact situation and, as in a test. 
And these are just the examples. I scroll them. It started a little bit, uh, at least in, for my history, from a, an, an, um, a fire in Korea, where you can see that in this case there are two buildings, and somehow the, the fire dynamics are special because you have a small chimney there, which uh, has increased the fire. Um, it only uh, mainly here spread it on in this kind of chimney. Uh, and it started at, at the floor level, uh, which was the only floor level which was not sprinkled. Uh, it was a technical area. But it anyhow spread it to the outside. There was no spread inside the building. Um, but you can see also, I, I take this example on, on the left always, that it's not easy to extinguish these fires. Uh, you see the hose there with the water. Uh, but uh, it's mainly done that to, to do some kind of screening, uh, radiation screening. I don't know, um, but at least it, it gives the, the challenges. And then we had uh, a number of fires, Dubai, Roubaix, Azerbaijan, Grenfell, and, and Grenfell uh, at the end also, where we had this external uh, facade fires, uh, very intensive, uh, and all depending a bit on, on the type of fire with, with high losses. And, and in certain cases, renovation projects, in certain other cases, new projects. And, and the systems have a complexity. It's not just one single material. Uh, it's a material where, where there are different uh, types of, of, of functions in that facade. Uh, one can be the thermal insulation, uh, the other is the rain screen, the other is a kind of humidity uh, screen, and, and, and so on. So there are a lot of functions, and, and they are complex. And it's not only by, uh, by a simple test that you can see the whole system behavior, because they are connected to, to a support structure again. And that one has to be fixed onto the walls and so on. So it's very complicated to, uh, to look into that. And in certain cases, it even uh, in LJ and green buildings, we have, uh, uh, like in this example, a lot of uh, plants or flowers on it. And what happens if they dry out and so on, and they are put there? So it, it and and how do we test that? To be honest, uh, yeah, it's it's not uh, not uh, not obvious. And in fact, a number of these slides were originated from. Uh, when I gave the Interflam keynote a few years uh, ago, and then the Grenfell fire had not happened. Uh, and uh, yeah, it's sad that I have to say it here again after a fire because I mentioned these problems already at that time. And it has to do with, with different risks. And just for, for an example of facades, you, you can have penetration through from one floor to another. Uh, you can have, in this case, uh, uh, let us say, the fire spread from the outside, inside the, the building through, through the non-functioning uh, firewall. Uh, you can have uh, safety distances using for that. Uh, you can have flame spread. And you have, last but not least, also falling parts. And I may be not complete with that, uh, with this overview. Uh, go a little bit through it, but um, um, it, it's important that you you look what tests can be, are these are the correct tests for all, all these kind of evaluations? Uh, what full-scale tests are necessary? I think there will be talks today, so I don't have to go into them. ISO has a facade full-scale test, but there are only many other, and this is just a, a short list. Uh, so what are some solutions here? You have to, to use the appropriate test for the correct, or the appropriate fire safety engineering procedure for the correct uh, risk. You cannot mix them all together. That you have to know what risk is, what fire test to have, did they match or not. Uh, and you have to see of the whole full system. So you cannot look to the outside only, uh, or maybe to the inside only. So you have to have this holistic view. Uh, also, that fire is not the only problem with that uh, system. You have humidity problems, you have, of course, the need for thermal insulation, you have rain screens, and so on and so on. Uh, and they all happening maybe of the ventilation, the fire cavity. And we have to ensure that if you change one component to another, that the quality is guaranteed, and also when it is installed compared to the testing. So these are all things, and I, I think uh, uh, before finishing off with, with the conclusions, that it's important that uh, in order to get and capture this whole system behavior, uh, and this whole system and all these kind of requirements, and maybe uh, dilemmas at a certain moment, you need high quality engineers. 
And that's one of the reasons we started the Erasmus Mundus program, and, and I've seen that there's uh, at least some alumni here also, which makes me always uh, happy, where we joined forces between, uh, uh, let's say, then Lund, Ghent, Edinburgh, and also with Queensland, ATH, and Maryland, because we, we feel that in order to capture all these problems, it's not always possible to do that with the, the resources today at one place. So you have to join forces and send the students. And I think this has been very successful, and the engineers coming from that program has proved to go very easily on, into the market. We have our own engineering degrees and also Edinburgh, so that doesn't mean that there are, there are two levels, but I think if we see it on an international field, we have to, to work more together. So to conclude, we uh, uh, have to look to this overall system behavior. We have to use correct tests, uh, and, and there's also a need, I want to repeat that, for a lot of more specific tests for this fire modeling, uh, which we are, maybe don't have standardized today. Uh, and we need performance-based design uh, for complex systems. Uh, you can try to complement it with prescriptive solutions, but I, I think it's, it's also need uh, for when it becomes very complex. Um, fire is a complex problem but as itself. It's not just one phenomenon like in, in mechanical engineering. It's a lot of things together. Um, so we, we have to prepare these future engineers for that, to have this holistic um, uh, approach together with the specialist in buildings, uh, in, in maybe ventilation systems, that we, we can have a good... Uh, and I think personally, and this of course talking from my own, own organization, we have to do that internationally, both in international educations, but also in international standardization. I think that's important to, to join forces. We are not a big community, and we need to build up a, a high critical mass, as I call it. Okay, thank you very much. Um, we have time for a few questions. Is there anybody with a burning question now? We have one down here. There's, there is a microphone which will be brought down. So if you can please say who you are and where you're from, and then um, it's just coming here down these stairs. Thank you. Um, yes. Uh, um, my question, well, it's more of an observation than a question. I, I'm Dave Allen from the London Borough of Ealing. I've recently been looking at a scheme and it was included uh, an enclosed car park. And when I uh, looked at the design in detail, I realized that it didn't comply with our, our approved documents uh, in terms of the uh, natural ventilation provision for smoke outlet. And so we had a, a, a fire engineering solution produced and then we had that fire engineering solution checked by a third party. And we found out that um, the they did a, a comparison of, of, of a scenario where the building design complied and one where it, it complied with the design which was a, a, um, a sort of hybrid between uh, um, assisted ventilation and natural. And as it turns out, uh, uh, the uh, proposed design, uh, the, the uh, fire engineering solution showed that it did in fact uh, uh, produce similar results or equal results to the compliant design but it also illustrated that neither of the two produced tenable conditions at the end of the day, which proved that the solution in the approved document must be well out of date in terms of the original uh, basis of that um, design criteria. Mm. Uh, along with what you were saying, if you don't keep things up to date, I think mm. this was based on uh, figures produced in the 1960s. And of course, cars have changed since the 1960s in both design, complexity, batteries, things like that. And so the overall fire load is bound to have changed since the 1960s. Mm. And yet the um, approved document, which is, uh, which is our uh, 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 base, uh, mm. ha has not altered. Mm. And, and so I think it, it, it really brought it home to me that that, that just be, like you said, just because it shows compliance doesn't mm. necessarily mean it's okay. Yeah, yeah, I, I fully agree with you. In, in fact, uh, and, and I think this is sometimes one of the tools you have to when you have the performance-based or the fire safety engineering is that you also, if if you doubt about uh, an, an, a prescriptive solution, as I can say it, you you could run 
uh, the engineering tools and see how well it is. And I have done that with my students in Ghent a few times where, where we checked uh, buildings which were designed according to the prescriptive illusion and defined uh, a design fire. I suddenly saw a bit like you that, yeah, the prescriptive solution is maybe a bit out of date, but it's not easy to keep that updated. I think yeah. it's a continuous process and it needs momentum also. Any other questions for Patrick? No? Okay. Well, if you do have anything, then please... Uh, I'm around here. Yeah, okay. catch him at lunchtime yeah. or in thank the break. You. So thank you very much. I think I have to do it like this.